Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Well, it was a little bit of a cool drive this morning. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, thankfully, it wasn't a bad drive. Let's pray. Father God, as we quiet our hearts now and are prepared to study your word to see what you have for us, God. Father, I ask that you would open our hearts to truth, our minds to your spirit. Help us to see you, understand your plan. To recognize you in a different way. Maybe a way we've never seen before, God. Maybe be in your presence. In Christ's name. <coughs> what is your daily routine like? What do you do in the morning? Mine? I tend to get up. Alarm goes off. I have two of them. I, I turn off the first one and I grab the, my phone for the second one. It's going to go off 10 minutes later, just in case. I stagger out of bed, grab my clothes, and I put them in the bathroom. Go and turn up the heat, usually I, if I'm the first one, though, which I usually am. Turn up the heat, start the coffee, get some water on the boil in case somebody wants some tea. Take my shower. Then I sit down and I have my quiet time, spend some time with, with God. And then everything after that, who knows what's going to happen because the day gets crazy. But that's my routine. Now, you have a routine too. But you sometimes find it hard to follow certain things because life happens, right? Interruptions happen, you get phone calls or whatever happens. But you're committed to certain things. Certain things you, you see as these are important. I'm going to make sure these occur. And most of us, it's like, I'm going to make sure I eat breakfast. I make sure that I spend time with God. I make sure that I do certain things that I know are good for my health, whether it be spiritually or physically. But it can be hard to follow this. It's a daily battle. Our memory verse is Luke 9.23. And it says this. It says, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up the cross daily and follow me. Now, this same passage has parallels in Matthew and in Mark. But only in Luke do we see this word daily. See, all of them stress commitment, the idea of taking up one's cross and following Christ. But I like the way Luke puts it because Luke adds daily. And that really kind of talks to where we are at this point, isn't it? Because we can be committed to something but it's a daily battle. It's a daily struggle. It's something that we have to decide every morning when we get up. Because if you're like me, when I get up, you know, I'm just like, all I want to do is pull the covers up. I don't want to get up. But we get up. We put one foot in front of another. And we do what we need to do. And as Christians, we're called to do this. We are called to be committed. We are called to take up our cross daily and follow it. Daily. But we live in an era where things are temporary. We live in an era where, you know, you start out and you have a job, but you look at the job as a stepping stone to something else. I work here, but... I'm going to get a better one, and a better one, and a better one. And sometimes we do that same thing in relationships, don't we? I'm dating this girl, or I'm dating this guy, until a better one comes to me. Sometimes we do that with friends. 
we get in relationships and it's like, well, yeah, I'll hang with this person for a while, but I'm looking for something better than life. We do it with social networks. We give up Facebook, Instagram, whatever. And that's no big deal, really, quite frankly. But it is very indicative of how we are as a society, where we see things as temporary. Used to be people got into a relationship, they, they got married, and then they lived together. But oftentimes anymore, we see over the several, last several decades, we see the rise of people living together without necessarily ever getting married. Is it they're, they're against the idea that they don't have enough money for a ceremony or something? What's the idea of commitment? I don't necessarily want to commit for that long. Temporary is okay. But maybe something better will come along. See the problem there? Commitment shouldn't be a dirty word. But unfortunately, sometimes in our society, it seems to be. We're called to commitment. We're called to be faithful. Because quite frankly, that's how Jesus is. He's ever faithful to us. And we are called to be his examples. We are called to be in the image of Christ. We are called to be committed. We are approaching, if you have not been aware of it, I know some of you are, the Lenten season. Lent starts on Wednesday, the Dash Wednesday. Um, and some of you probably, you have a good handle of what Lent is, but in case some of you don't, I want to take a, just a few minutes to explain it a little bit. Lent actually comes from the German word lengthen, which means spring. It is a, a time before Easter, 40 days before Easter, 40 weekdays and a Saturday before, uh, before uh, Easter with six Sundays thrown in. And the idea behind Lent, and it's been celebrated for centuries in, uh, by the Catholics, by the Methodists, by Lutherans, by Episcopalians, <coughs> etc., the idea behind it is that you are basically repenting from something. You are giving up something. You're fasting from something for a while. The 40 days is symbolic of the 40 days that Christ spent in the wilderness in preparation for his ministry. And so you oftentimes see in certain different groups have different practices. The certain ones will fast for maybe six days and then have a mini Easter on a Sunday. And fast for another six days, many Easter on a Sunday, that kind of thing, moving up. And some of the things that some of the stricter denominations would um, would fast from, they would fast from things like fish and meat and eggs and fats and milk and sugar. And they would go this whole time without having that, except maybe on a Sunday. And um, all in denying yourself and working toward Easter where you were celebrating Christ. Uh, other groups do, don't go quite that strict, but they give up a luxury item. They'll say, well, you know, I have um, chocolate. I love chocolate. Well, for 40 days, I'm going to give up chocolate. Or I'm going to give up ice cream. Or I'm going to give up alcohol. I'm going to give up smoking. So many people quit smoking during that time period. Hopefully they continue. Um... But that's, that's the idea. The, the biggest component, though, is the idea of turning away from something, a repentance. And you see that on Ash Wednesday, which starts it, when you might see somebody this Wednesday, you might see somebody with a covered cross. You know, if they, if they belong to a certain denomination, they will have, a, they take ashes that have been dipped in olive oil, and they will make a cross on their forehead. And that is a sign of them basically starting Lent, of giving up things, of beginning to practice this for the next 46 days. And don't get me wrong, there is nothing wrong with having a period of penitence, of giving up something, of, of deciding that we are going to refocus. I mean, we should be 
focusing on God. You should spend that time in, in preparation. I have no problem with that. Here's the issue. Sometimes it can be dangerous. Let me tell you why. Because sometimes people look at Lent and they think, okay, well, if I do this, etc., I'm going to somehow earn brownie points with God. God's going to look at my life and go, wow, he or she is so holy. Look at what they're doing for me. I think I'll reward them. We're not earning extra brownie points with God. That's not what it's for. Nor is it something that we should just think, I'm giving it up. <coughs> I'm such a good person for giving this up. But when it's done, hey, I can get right back to it. <coughs> you see, it's one thing to give up chocolate for 40 days. Big deal. But the problem is, is that sometimes people sacrifice something that is a little bit more of a spiritual importance. And then they go right back to doing it. You see... It sometimes reinforces our idea of a temporary following rather than a committed following. You've heard of Mardi Gras, right? New Orleans has a big festival, Mardi Gras. You know what it means? It means in French, it means Fat Tuesday. And sometimes it's translated as Shrove Tuesday. And if you guys are English scholars, you know what that means. Shrove comes from the verb to shrive means to basically to confess to a priest and he gives you penance and he gives you um, absolution for what you've done. And then on Ash Wednesday, you are to then begin that penance, begin that fasting, begin that time of moving toward Easter. The problem is, is that oftentimes on Shrove Tuesday, people would take it a little bit too far because they would have all these things that were giving up, like the fat and the meat and the eggs, and they'd throw it all together and have a big, big party. Nothing wrong with that. But then it got out of hand. Then people started to say, well, what we're doing, we're giving up these other things for a while, but let's just indulge in stuff on that day before. And so you see in Mardi Gras, you see people getting blasted, drinking to the, they're, they're sick, and they're you know, falling down. And, and if you go to New Orleans and some places like that, you'll see a lot of times women going around without any shirts on, etc. You know, and the bare-breasted look, etc. Because it is something that you do on that day. It's become a tradition. It's become a tradition to engage oftentimes in premarital sex. It's become a tradition to do a whole lot of things on that Tuesday and then Wednesday. Oh, we're, we're back to being good. You see the issue? You see the problem? And then they repeat the cycle. That is not how we are to live. We are to live in a committed state. We are to live as Christians of turning away from that stuff that we were once involved in and instead living a new life in Christ. You see, when we do it the other way, it's reminiscent of Proverbs 26, 11. Put that up there. Proverbs 26, 11 says, As a dog returns to his vomit, so fools repeat their folly. If you decide that I'm going to turn away temporarily, but then go back to it, what are you doing? You're going back to that bad stuff, the way you used to be. It's not the way we are to be. We're called to be better than this. We're called to be different. We're called to be new creatures in Christ. We are called to be dead to sin. Dead to sin. It's basically saying that part of my life is past. I'm finished with that. A few weeks ago, we looked at a, an example of Elisha when he began following Elijah. And if you remember what happened in that story, when Elisha decided to follow Elijah, 
he had been plowing. He had a, a yoke, he was, there was 12 of them, he had a, a yoke of oxen. In other words, he had two oxen and he had his yoke and he's plowing. And when he ends up following, what does he do? He takes his oxen, his livelihood, and he slaughters them. And then he takes his plowing equipment and he breaks it up, he puts it on fire, and he cooks the meat of his animals on this fire. And then he gives the meat to the people. And then he follows Elijah. Look at the symbolism. Elisha can't go back. His past is dead to him. He's turned from that. And he's embraced in a new life. And that's exactly what we're to do when we become Christians. We turn from that lifestyle. And we embrace a new life. Many of you in this room have been baptized. Do you understand what that means? When you repent of your sins, you repent of that lifestyle, you repent of the past and you embrace the free gift that Jesus Christ gives you, we baptize you. You are buried under that water in the likeness of Jesus' death. And then you are raised in the likeness of His resurrection. It's symbolic of going under that water and leaving that past behind. You're dead. But you're rising a new creature in Christ. It's a beautiful symbol. But we need to make it a reality. It needs to be something we live on a daily basis. Of we, we have renounced, we've become dead to sin. And we are living the new life. Look at Romans 6, 1 through 4. It says here, what should we say then? Shall, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. We too may live a new life. That's what we're called to do. Not to go back to the old. But to live a new life. To be transformed. I mean... Come on, a, a butterfly, when, when it finally breaks from its cocoon and, and the life flows into those wings and it flaps and it gets up in the sky, you don't see it coming back down and, oh, let me get crawl back into my cocoon. <laughs> no. That's over with. Amen. That's done. Let's not do that as people. Let's not spiritually do that. Let's not... Spread our wings in Christ and then go back to the way it was. I mean, we are, it says, we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Would you really want to? I mean, I became a Christian as a young kid. All right? And yet, I still sinned. I still got into things. Sin still had its books in me at times. But Christ has freed me from that. And when I look back at some of those things, some of those habits, some of those, those things that I was involved in, I don't want to go back. I, I don't want to go back there. I was miserable. Do you? Do you want to go back into some of those attitudes, those habits? We should. Because that's not what we're called to. You see, sin, sin is a lot like the sirens in Greek mythology, where we even get our word siren in English. You know, it comes from the Greek mythology of these mythological creatures, these women who lived on these islands. And they would lure sailors to their deaths. 
because they would sing these beautiful songs that were really attractive. And the sailors, and they're, as they're singing it all, they would hear this, oh, beautiful women, oh, and they'd be filled with this desire. And they would steer toward the rocks, and then their ships would break on the rocks. And in some of the legends, then these women, who were actually half woman, half bird, would come out and eat. And that's a perfect picture of sin. Sin lures us in. It sounds attractive. It sounds like something we would enjoy. And we might enjoy it temporarily. But then it will lead us a life. As believers, we're to move forward, not backward. But that requires us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. To be alive in Christ. See, non-Christians often have a misguided view of Christians. They think that we're all about rules. We're all about the don'ts. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. Do this way, have these rules. They forget an important part. We might be dead to those things, but that doesn't mean we're dead. We're to be alive to something completely different. We're to be alive to Christ and the living for Him. Even some believers get that way. They, they get so bound up in the legalism and they look like they've been sucking on lemons all day. You know? And that's not how we're to live. We're to live in the joy of living for Christ. Of enjoying His presence. Of doing the things that He would like us to do. That's true Christianity. It's not bound up in, in, in legalism. Yes, it's avoiding certain things, absolutely. But you're replacing them with life. With living in a way that is totally different. Look at Romans 6, 11 through 13. It says, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to Him as an instrument of righteousness. You see that? You're, you're, you're dead to sin, yes. But you're alive in Christ. There's a contrast here. Now we can truly live. We can truly fulfill our purpose. We were created for a reason. We were created to be instruments of His righteousness. You know, sometimes people probably think I'm nuts. You may think I'm nuts. But I'll be driving on the road to church. You know, I live in Yukon, so driving takes about 35 minutes to get there. And sometimes I'll get into these imaginary conversations with atheists. And, and I, I'm having this great discussion with these atheists, and people around me are driving past me going, um, but I, 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 and I'm talking with them, and, and, and I'm, I'm trying to understand how you can be an atheist. Because quite frankly, quite frankly, there's too much evidence out there that there is something, someone has made us, and it's not just by chance. But it's not just that. I cannot conceive of how you can be an atheist and keep on living. Because for me, there's no purpose otherwise. If there is no God, there is no purpose in this life. It's all just random accident. And I don't know, that makes me sociopathic. I'm like, I've got to have meaning. 
We've got to have a reason for being. And without God, there would be no meaning. It's purposeless. And we, you and I, would be useless. Just scraps of flesh. But thankfully, we're not. We do have meaning. There is purpose in life. We can be instruments of righteousness. So now we are dead to sin. We are alive in Christ. But now we have become slaves uh, to righteousness. Now I realize that that word in our society, slave, is, is a harsh word. And with good reason. Because oftentimes in our society and in modern history, when we look at slavery, we see it as repugnant. We see it as people being chained and beaten and forced to do things that they never had any choice of. We see people nowadays in sexual slavery. You know, they have no real way of escaping. It is terrible. And so we view slavery as this this repugnant thing with good reason. But we need to understand a definition, a biblical definition of slavery. And we need to understand our true selves and how this really relates to us. Let's look at Romans 6, 16 through 18. He says, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey. Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you've come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You've been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Catch that word in there. It's so very different from the slavery that we often associate. I mean, first of all, it uses words like offer yourself. Offer yourself. This is a voluntary, voluntary thing. It's a free will choice. We offer ourselves either to sin or to righteousness to fall in love. Now, sin's power, that's very real. You and I were born into sin. Our ancestor Adam sinned. By his sin, it was somehow spiritually, genetically transferred to us and we live, we are born sinners. However, we have a choice of whether we go deeper into sin or not. You see people who are non-Christians, right? And they live pretty good lives because they are choosing not to go deeper and deeper into sin. We have a choice. The thing is that as Christians, if we believe in Jesus Christ, if we accept that gift that He's given us, His sacrifice, He frees us from sin. We are no longer bound by it like the rest of the world. And then we are truly free. But being truly free doesn't mean we have this myth of independence. Because we were created to serve. And that's not a bad thing. Leaders also serve. Right? We're created to be an image of God. We're created as leaders, yes. But leaders serve too. Just who are you going to serve? Are you going to serve God? Righteousness. Or are you going to serve sin, which is everything else? Whether it is yourself, you're deluding yourself and saying, I'm just serving myself. You are still serving the world. You're still serving the sin nature. Because there's only two choices. We serve God or we serve evil in all its forms. We've been set free from Christ, through Christ. 
We've set free, been set free to be slaves to righteousness. And it says in this passage to obey from our hearts. We want to obey. It's a choice because we've given him our allegiance. We have made that decision to follow. So, dead to sin, alive in Christ, slaves to righteousness. But to do this, we need to possess a different mindset. In the King James Version and related translations, the Proverbs 23, 7 starts out this way. It says, as a man thinks, so is he. As a man thinks, so is he. It's easy to pursue sin mentally, to fall into its trap. I mean, how many of you like ice cream? Anybody? Now, I know people who love ice cream. Some of them in my family. And they love ice cream. And if they begin to think about ice cream, they think about its coldness and its lusciousness. Right? And maybe think of your favorite flavor here, okay? And maybe your favorite condiments. And you begin to... Uh, and the more and more you think about it, the more you want it, right? Yeah, it could be whatever it may be. If you, I mean, it may be... I don't know, tofu. But whatever it is with you, that, that you, you, know, you, just, you focus on. And it, the more you think about it, the more you lust after it. And I'm using that word deliberately. You see, lust oftentimes we think about as only sexual. It's not. Lust is anything we are focused on, we're concentrating on, we want it so bad, we'll do almost anything to get it. And when we do that, with the things of this world that leads us into sin. It leads us into paths that we don't want to go. The more you focus on it, you ever notice the harder it is to escape. But we don't have to be slaves to sin. Romans 8, 5 through 8 tells us this. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is, is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh not please God. So are we living in the realm of the flesh or the realm of the spirit? Are we living where we are controlled by our own lusts, our own desires, the sinfulness that tries to, to pull us in that direction, to lure us to the rocks, to destroy us? Are we going to be ruled instead by the Spirit? The Spirit that God has given us through Jesus Christ. Which do you choose? Which do you choose? We're told in other places to take every thought captive and to renew our minds. And you might say, well, that's impossible, isn't it? We wouldn't be told to do it if it was impossible. Philippians 4, 8 through 9. Let me read this to you. It says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. We can capture our thoughts. We can focus. We can pick up our cross daily and follow God. But it's a choice. It's a choice. 
It's a battle, but it's doable. So we come to our big question of the day is, what will Lent mean to you this year? Will it, maybe you'll ignore it. Maybe it's just something you, oh yeah, it's coming up, and I thought I'd give up, um, you know, I don't know, chocolate. Or, or I'd forgive up, give up something that I don't want. Like, I think I'll give up homework for Lent. <laughs> It's not exactly what it's supposed to be. The thing is, is that wouldn't it be cool if instead of just giving up something temporary, you gave up something forever. Something that has been holding you back from your spiritual life. Something that's been keeping you from being who you were designed to be in Christ. Wouldn't it be cool if you could just get that up? Because God wants to draw us closer. So I've got some suggestions of things we can give up. Give up grumbling. Instead, in everything it thinks. I mean, constructive criticism is okay, but moaning, groaning, complaining, that's not Christian discipline to people. So give those up. You want to give something up? How about give up 10 to 15 minutes in bed and instead use that time in prayer, Bible study, personal devotion? You've got it. Why not give that up for God? Why not give up looking at other people's worst points? Instead, concentrate on their best points. You know, we all have our faults. It's a lot easier to have people overlook our shortcomings when we overlook theirs. How about giving up speaking unkindly about people? Instead, let your speech be generous and understanding. It costs so little to say something kind and uplifting. Why not check that sharp tongue at the door? Or how about give up your hatred of anyone or anything? Instead, learn the discipline of love, because love covers a multitude of sins. How about giving up your worries and anxieties? Instead, trust God with them. Anxiety is spending emotional energy on something we can do nothing about. Like tomorrow, we can't do anything about that. We don't know what's going to happen. Live today and let God's grace be sufficient for us. How about giving up TV or internet one evening a week? You say, well, I still have my phone. Give that up to Instead, why don't you take that time and do something more productive? Maybe you could visit some lonely or sick person. There are those who are isolated by illness and age. Maybe you could go talk with a friend. You can look around. Maybe there's someone who really needs you. Maybe give up buying anything but essentials for yourself. Instead, give the money to God. I mean, we spend, we waste a lot of money, don't we? And there's a lot of things that we could use our money for that would be far more productive than money. They have eternal rewards than what we spend our money on. Mm -hmm. Give up judging by appearances and by the standard of the world because there's only <coughs> one who has a right to judge, and that's Jesus Christ, right? Instead, learn to give up yourself. Uh, I think those are good things to do. Uh, We're coming to a time of communion, a time where we can talk with God. We can confess. We can repent. This would be a really good time. A really good time to ask God. What do you want from me? I'm, I'm going to celebrate this. I'm going to 
symbolically take your body and your blood. What do you want from me? What do you want from me this season? And for the rest of my life? Father, we thank you for this morning we can come to the